Hey everybody, I have a few announcements to make about what's going on at Renegade University. One of them is quite urgent for some of you. That is that our upcoming webinar, Make Your Own Guns, A Guide to 3D Printed Firearms, has exactly four seats left. Now that's people who will take it live. If you get this too late and it's already sold out, you can still buy the course and watch the entire thing just like anyone else at your leisure as a video course. You can do that now or you can wait till it's over, but it will be available for video streaming to anyone who buys the course. So do it. That is also true for our other recent webinars, which were really popular and a lot of people didn't get to take them live. They're available for sale right now at renegadeuniversity.com on the front page, or you can click video courses and you'll see them right there. These include our Talk and Shit series, which is a series of webinars on African-American history and culture. The first one was on African-American culture, co-taught by Kamasi Hill and me. Then Kamasi taught a fantastic course on the history of hip hop, which I loved taking as a student. Hotep Jesus was there. Hotep Jesus, by the way, was in both those. He was in both Talk and Shits. As a student, um, just the best courses I've ever seen or been a part of at any university. Really incredible, really amazing content. I love teaching them. I love taking them. Then the most popular course we've had so far was the course on postmodernism, critical theory, and American politics co-taught by James Lindsay, who's been quite controversial lately, and me. That too is available for streaming. Go to renegadeuniversity.com buy those courses, watch them, and tell me, tell me if there are better versions of those courses at Harvard or Yale or Stanford or anywhere. I think not. Thanks a lot. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. My guest this week is a 29-year-old woman who has no advanced degrees and who, in her podcast, sits on the floor, smokes cigarettes and cannabis, and drinks, and just talks into a microphone. And I learn more from her than I have from any of the hundreds of professors I have known in my life. This is my interview with Dasha Nekrasova. I am joined from New York by the great, the one and only Dasha Nekrasova, who I just found Hi. out actually Americanizes you. Americanize your last name because I had, I realized I'd never heard your last name pronounced. So I, I was in this frantic um, <laughs> hurry to, to learn it. I, I looked up the pronunciation and then you told me, no, I don't even do the Russian pronunciation. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I, you can if you want. Nekrasova. Well, it's it, Nekrasova just doesn't sound as it's kind of accented anyway. My real name's Daria, Daria Dmitrievna Nekrasova. Oh, we'll which forget is that. Very beautiful, but is not. That's why I changed my name to Dasha. Yeah, that's not happening. Not mm -hmm. in America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Dasha, listen, I'm um, a 55 year old college professor, and mm -hmm. and I think you're a genius. Oh, th thank you. <laughs> that's really <laughs> I, nice. I <laughs> let, me, let me tell you, like, if someone and I started listening to your podcast, Red Scare, for those who don't know, for those few losers who don't know, um, I started listening to it about a year ago. Fans of my show told me to check you guys out. And I was like, 
two millennial chicks who sit on the floor smoking cigarettes and drinking? Why? <laughs> there's no chance. Like, you know, there's so much, the, the low effort here is just too much for me. I can't, I can't go on. And yeah. uh, after, but about halfway through the first episode, I thought, holy Christ, these two are possibly the most interesting public intellectuals we've got. <laughs> oh God. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> I mean that I, I, um, yeah, we're sort of in this, we operate in the same world. So we have similar heroes. Like I'm a big Glenn Greenwald fanboy. but yeah, the two of you and each of you have your own take, but you and Anna, your co-host, mm -hmm. I just, I've just never heard anything like that. And certainly not from anyone your age. And um, there's like a half a dozen people in this country that I consider to be interesting intellectuals and you're among them right now, but Thank you. I'll also say this from podcaster to podcaster, and this will, this will hurt the feelings of some of my friends, but I have to say it. I mean, your podcast is the only one I listen to regularly now. <laughs> Thanks. How about that? You got enough compliments? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, I think our kind of low effort veneer and the aesthetic of the pod is a kind of yeah it's a way to keep people on their toes and <laughs> surprise them with the insights contained therein it's not just an unwillingness to do the work that too well it's just it's <laughs> we just can't it's not an unwillingness more of a just a kind of general incompetence <laughs> right you know jack the perfume nationalist you've been on his show right mm -hmm. yeah he's a friend of mine so he says he calls your podcast a work of art or an art podcast yeah, he was he wrote a very interesting sort of essay long form blog about about Red Scare early on where he was trying to sort of um articulate what was artistic about it. Mm. And it's interesting, yeah. We didn't set out I think to be an an art pod, but it did work out that way. What do you think of that? I'm still I'm still processing that. I mean, I I feel like podcasting is the only thing I've ever done in my career that feels like art, but I can't quite say why, except that it's a creative process with someone. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I am, I guess, an artist. So I am in the business of like generating aesthetics. Right. And that's definitely part of Red Scare for sure. Yeah. For those of for those who don't know, haven't listened. I mean, you you guys talk about politics, you talk about film, you talk about fashion, you talk about style, you talk about aesthetics in various ways. Mm -hmm. Talk about feminism, neoliberalism, and you have just different takes on everything, and takes that get you in trouble, and takes that run counter not only to the the people you live around, meaning like the left liberal world there, but counter to your past. Right. Mm -hmm. You guys have changed. And in fact, you just said in the last episode, I think that you are now post left, not only post left, <laughs> you're post political. Mm, yeah. But I'm open to I'm open to being radicalized. <laughs> <laughs> so you haven't even you're about to turn 30 years old, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. and uh, I told you before we started recording that I was depressed for six months before I turned 30 and six months after. But it sounds yeah. like you, uh, you're getting sick of politics. You, oh, you quit Twitter. That's the big news. I did. I left Twitter. And why? And is that, how's that working out? Um, it's okay. I feel a little ambivalent about it because I did, I've been on Twitter. I joined Twitter on my 20th birthday. Mm. Um, and so I've been on it for a long time and I really used to have a lot of fun on it. And as I got more followers and became increasingly sort of a public facing person it got less and less fun and Anna and I are both pretty desensitized I think to the back the backlash mm -hmm. just because it's been happening for so long but when I um criticized AOC's in like her what was it was it like an Instagram live video yeah. where she disclosed that she was a victim of sexual assault and was sort of talking about her um the trauma of the insurrection where she almost died <laughs> mm -hmm. i'm doing air quotes people can't see um th the backlash was so kind of like fervent and mm, oh. fanatical and mentally ill that it really my mentions finally just got to a, a point where i didn't really want to look at them anymore oh that was the breaking point I see. And I have a film coming out that's premiering at 
um, Berlin Film Festival next month. And I'm an actress as well. So I'm right. working on um, a show right now. And just at the behest of my management also, they were kind of like, maybe you can cool it on the on the hot takes. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> mm -hmm. Bad for the career, huh? Bad, bad for mental health, right? Bad for mental health. And yeah, and ultimately, like, I'm not a, I'm not a politician. I don't have political ambitions. Um, so it's really not, it's not really my fight. Right. I feel like, and in that way, I do feel post-political, I guess. So you think AOC was living up to the stereotype of the weak, vulnerable woman, right? When she's, I think she's that's about. the most gen, like generous read of it. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, um, yeah, that she's legitimately sort of traumatized because she's like a scared young girl you and know you, yeah you got you guys were uh, very unsettled by lawmakers crying in public i don't know how i feel about that <laughs> you were I mean, people have uh, that i've talked to have been like well republicans are always doing grievance politics it's just you know when men have tantrums, it just looks very different than when like a woman has a tantrum and this has been, um, the left is sort of like co-opting the tactics of the right, but the right's been victimizing themselves forever, mm -hmm. um, which I suppose is true, but is still, the feels undignified to me. <laughs> right, and the, and the victimology pisses you off, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely in political life. I don't think Congress people ought to be victimizing themselves. That is interesting. I think that might be historic. When you guys were talking about it, I realized I don't think there's ever been a time when a, a sitting congressperson has, has cried in public about something that happened to them in the past, like that, some past trauma, and also a trauma that's fairly common, right? Yeah, extremely common. Right. And so and what, yeah. certainly traumatic and not illegitimate and i don't think she's lying or you know <laughs> right i think her experience is valid i just don't think it's a appropriate forum mm -hmm. or i mean i'm per i'm obsessed with trauma and i talk about it constantly and make work about it but it's um most of those conversations are with my like therapist or my or my friends so when you say you make work about it um do you mean in your filmmaking yeah, in a way, uh -huh. my movie is about, um, it's like sort of a psychological thriller that is set in the aftermath of the Jeffrey Epstein's death. Um, and it's about these girls who move into an apartment on the Upper East Side that they discover used to belong to him and then become sort of like haunted by it. And hun possession and sort of hauntology, I think, is a is about trauma. Hmm. What kind of trauma in this case? Um, I guess more sort of like ephemeral psychic trauma, mm -hmm. like <laughs> inherited trauma in the case of, you know, Epstein's case. I think there's lots of implications about say like the trauma of poverty that makes people vulnerable to that kind of exploitation in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and the trauma of ex exploitation, I guess, which is real. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. I want to, um, what is your objective when you make film? Because you don't talk that much about your filmmaking on the podcast. In well, this is my first movie. Yeah, but I mean, in terms of your ideas about filmmaking, I haven't heard you talk much about it. What's, do you have an object? You must have an objective. Um... Yeah, I guess to, I don't have an agenda <laughs> No, I know yeah. necessarily, but um, my objective is to sort of visually and thematically articulate something that I believe to be fundamentally true mm -hmm. about the world and to sort of synthesize my experiences and 
aesthetics and ideas into like a coherent form, which is a film. What do you, what do you want to do to the audience? Mm. I mean, ideally as an artist, the goal is to have people experience some kind of catharsis, but um, that's a very ambitious aim. Whoa. That I, as a, you know, young first time filmmaker, don't know if I accomplish, but I think my movie is, you know, um, pretty compelling and evocative and will, I want to, I want to evoke some kind of feeling or sentiment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is there, I mean, is, there must be a politics in it. How would you describe it politically? Mm. Well, I don't know, because I don't know. I guess I've been struggling with describing politics in general. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> you do that for a living. What do you mean? <laughs> you do it every week. Well, like what? Like, I guess, are you asking in terms of like, is the film, does the film have like a, a leftist or perspective? Or anything. Yeah. I mean, it's about, it's about a political case in a sense, right? So I would imagine. Yeah. I mean, well, well, I guess, yeah, the movie is about how there is a ruling class whose interests run counter to the vast majority of people. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but depend sort of on there being a permanent underclass for them to exploit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and how would, and uh, you guys get into a lot of trouble with feminists and feminism. How would you... Mm -hmm. how, will, how will a feminist see this movie? Well, I think it's a very feminist film, actually. I think it, um, I was very influenced by, I mean, I guess, well, so I was very influenced by this case in Malaysia in like the 60s and 70s, I think, when there was sort of um, a phenomenon epidemic of like, Malaysian female factory workers becoming like possessed by by demons oh. and sort of like convulsing on the factory floors and like disrupting production oh wow in this very like visceral way that was very informed by Malaysian culture prior to being industrialized so in my film without giving too much away yeah basically one of the female characters becomes sort of possessed by this um pedophilic kind of entity she develops this very like demonic infatuation with prince andrew <laughs> um and that to me felt like a kind of um it is feminist in a way because it's a kind of like embodied resistance to a kind of feminine experience of being preyed on sexually, mm -hmm. particularly by um, the elites. <laughs> okay. So is it, is it sort of a metaphor for that, for like class oppression? Well, I wouldn't say it's a metaphor because the Epstein stuff isn't a metaphor. Right. You know, it just, it just is. Um, of systematic oppression. I mean, he was a human trafficker. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah. <laughs> so there's so there's resistance going on in your film though by women, and it takes the form of this this possession though. The possession represents. It's a nonlinear <laughs> resistance, and the film is also about a kind of futility. Okay. You know, in in confronting these ideas and you know the cabal or whatever you want to call it um the ultimate yeah sort of futility of contending with that power structure oh so i mean this sounds like what you've been talking about lately how you you're very it sounds like you're very sick of left-wing politics generally and maybe maybe politics overall but are you do you are you pessimistic are you blackpilled about the future? Is this what you're saying here? Is it is it is it 
Is it futile to resist the ruling class? Mm, it definitely feels that way. Though I was watching, I watched the first half of the new Adam Curtis documentary. Uh -huh. um, and it touches on a lot of the same, the same themes. So I am, I am pessimistic, but not maybe, you know, maybe not fully blackpilled. Okay. I think that there's, you know, there's very private or even not so private forms of resistance, which are, which can be accessed via like something like the avant-garde or, you know, there's not, I don't think we're quite <laughs> in the, the matrix. Right. <laughs> I think that there are, is sort of opportunity. Okay. So <laughs> what we have is a vast matrix that's dominated by the political parties, the media, which you guys are very critical of all the time. And it does feel all pervasive and you call this neoliberalism, right? Mm -hmm. How, what does neoliberalism mean to you? <laughs> I know it's, I know it's, <laughs> but I have to ask it. I have to ask it because it's used all the time. <laughs> You're like, you don't want to answer this question. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it is, it's a good, um, sort of catch-all for a contemporary condition of, I, I don't even want to call it like late capitalism because it feels like we're past, we're past that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's sort of encapsulated, I guess, by like the, there is no alternative kind of Thatcherism of like a total conflation of political life and this sort of zero sum, like ruthlessness of social life and mm -hmm. an overextension of an overproduction of sort of goods and concepts and services that ought not ex to exist. <laughs> oh, really? Wait, what, what should not exist? I mean, I'll, you know, when I, when COVID first happened and it was like a couple months into lockdown here in New York, which was very, um, you know, rigid, I was like walking around and just kind of looking at all of the excesses of culture that took on this kind of like apocalyptic quality. Right. And it felt like yeah, we've sort of, um, we've gone too far. <laughs> <laughs> but like what, what, what would be? I mean, speci specifically, I saw like a billboard for um, A Quiet Place 2. And I was like, wow, like all, of <laughs> so much industry and so many resources went into making A Quiet Place 2 and then this billboard the movie and sequel the movie yeah. the sequel to a quiet place yeah, yeah. <laughs> and at that point it had come out like months prior no one had replaced it because it was covid and it was like it just felt like this if this was the end of the world and this is what i was seeing i would understand how we we got to this place you know so you see that as overproduction i mean maybe that's the wrong word for it i don't know but, but just... it does feel like Mm. yeah it's easier to Im imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism it feels like we were inundated with the excesses of capitalism yeah but now it's all been taken away and much of it has been taken away over the last year right mm -hmm. how do you yeah. feel, and how do you feel about that i mean i i feel horribly deprived of that stuff i wish i could go to the movies i wish i, I wish i could go see Bad a quiet place too. Yeah, I know. Quiet, yeah. I know. <laughs> um, well, I think that I I also do feel deprived, but I think it's it just is what it is. I've reached a kind of like acceptance and peace with it, and I think that new forms will emerge. Um, you know, I think the, the Quiet Place 2 poster struck me because it was like Hollywood, for example, is an industry that's really um, 
bloated and overextended and can't really sustain itself. And so in a way it's good that things are being destroyed because it means people have to adapt and new things will, will emerge. Right. And, and things have to really earn their place in our culture now, right? I mean, hopefully, but I doubt it. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly one year ago, Carlos and Vanessa Abelar were set to open their beautiful store in downtown San Antonio, selling CBD products. They were hoping especially to get the word out about CBD to what Carlos calls the brown part of town in San Antonio. Of course, that was immediately before the Texas government, like all the governments in the United States, shut down the whole society. They had to close their store. They lost all the money they put into the store, all the time and effort and creativity, and they thought they were done. But they reached out to me and they said, can you please get the word out for Paloma Verde CBD? And I said, absolutely, because I believe in CBD. I've been using it for many years. I tested their products and I found all of them to be fantastic. I also found that they were willing to give unregistered listeners an incredible discount, which is 25% off every single product in the store. More on that in a second. So I started to do these ads for them for Paloma Verde CBD and sending people to palomaverdestore.com and telling them to use the discount code Renegade to get that discount and many other discounts as well. And guess what? Without that brick and mortar store, just with an online presence, and almost entirely because of you beautiful unregistered listeners, Paloma Verde CBD is thriving and even selling out of many of their products. They are fully restocked now and they're ready to take your order. So again, go to palomaverdestore.com, use the discount code RENEGADE, 25% off every single thing in the store, another 10% off if you join their mailing list, so that would be 35% off if it's your first order, and then they've put together my three favorite Paloma Verde products into what's called the Unregistered Combo Pack, but you should call it the Thad Pack because the cool kids do. That includes their gummies, 10 milligrams of CBD per gummy. And I'm telling you, these are just about the best tasting gummies either with or without THC I've ever tasted, but these are CBD only. Many delicious fruit flavors. They taste like candy. I eat too much of them. They're soft gels, 25 milligrams of CBD per soft gel. I take these daily for all the stresses that we've been encountering not just over the last year, but maybe over our entire lives. And my very favorite thing, the fast acting tincture, high potency tincture, put some drops under your tongue. It helps me with my sleep issues and with my anxiety issues, and I love it. The other thing I've been using recently, and I've been talking a lot about this, I didn't even tell Carlos and Vanessa, but I've had a lot of issues with my hands getting really dry and then I burned my hand about a week ago. I love, first of all, they have a, a THC-free hemp cream, which I adore. And this, the salve though, get their salve if you have any trouble with uh, cracked or dry skin. It has helped my hands tremendously. I love this stuff. I use it all day, every day now, because my hands are so jacked up because of the damn pandemic. All right, go to palomaverdestore.com. Use the discount code RENEGADE. Your body's gonna feel better. I think you're gonna feel better. And I really thank you. So back to politics. So you didn't you say you're post-left? Maybe that was Anna, but I thought you agreed with her. You're, um, you're calling yourself post-left. You guys are post-left. You're not, I mean, maybe, I mean, especially Anna, but I think it sounds, well, you tell us. Like, are you post-left? What does that mean? How do you feel about the left generally here? Um, I feel hostile towards the left, sure, because um, I feel like there was a small window of time maybe where the left could have had real momentum and they sabotaged <laughs> it and sort of refused to capitalize on it and seeing the way that the left eats itself as people say um is was did really alienate me from it 
but I'm not, you know, I was never like a card carrying DSA member or anything. It's not like I have right. um, anything to renounce really, but I was like a Bernie supporter. Um, and I felt, you know, in two election cycles and then to have, to feel basically sort of sold out to, to the Democrats yep. made it. And for now there to really just be nothing, no momentum, it feels like. So, yeah, what is, what do you want politically? Like, how do you want to organize society? I mean, are you essentially a social Democrat? Is that what's going on? Mm. In terms of economics. Um, yeah, I guess so. I so, guess I, yeah, I would want there to be sort of like, a, a safety net provided mm -hmm. by the state mm -hmm. um, and for there to just be regulation that would take care of people and alleviate their, their suffering. Mm -hmm. mm, but there isn't, there's, there isn't any, there's no real like candidates behind who to rally or anything or I'm not. Well, wait a minute. It's your girl AOC. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the big social Democrat now. Yeah, I got, and if it seemed advantageous to politically for me to support her, I would, she's not my congressperson. You know, I'm not one of her delegates. Right, but as a national figure, I mean, she's really carrying the Bernie torch, right? Isn't she the I, next Bernie? I guess so. Why are you throwing her under know. the bus for being emotional? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess because I don't agree with her tactics. I don't know. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I, I would be if I were a social democrat. Because I, I would... hate because I hate women. Are you a libertarian? Is that? Uh. -uh. <laughs> no. What's your? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. No. Um. I hang out with a lot of libertarians. I'm an ex-socialist. Yeah. And um, I, I'm just my own guy. I don't know. I'm sort of like you guys. I, I'm, I'm. Yeah. So I guess I would be hesitant to actually describe myself as like a social democrat because I don't totally understand what that means. Yeah. And you don't talk about it much on the podcast. That's why I was curious. But I mean, you generally, you're generally sympathetic to the idea of the state like providing some goods and services to people yeah safety net kind of stuff like universal basic basic income medicare for all all that kind of thing yeah i mean i think i do fundamentally believe also in democracy do you um well a, a kind of idealized <laughs> democracy yeah but not one where um it feels like the majority of people don't have access to uh to the information <laughs> about reality I got to tell you, myself included, you know, I got to tell you, I have become, this is fairly recent. I have become totally anti-democratic. I just, for a lot of reasons, one is. Who do you think should rule? <laughs> that I'm not so sure about, but I know that I don't want to do it. Like I don't want to rule. That's what democracy is, right? I don't want to manage stuff. I don't want to, I don't want to decide where the stoplights go. But that's, you elect someone who makes those decisions on your behalf. Yeah, but then you got to study who you elect, you know, and you got to like, you got to know stuff. You, as you were saying, you got to know stuff. You don't, about have, you don't have to study if they appeal to you on a visceral level, which oh, AOC really? doesn't, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> well, then we'll just all be standing around crying about stuff. <laughs> uh, the, other, the other objection I have, there is work, though. I mean, the more democratic you are, the more work is involved, right? Yeah, then you have like civic duties, I guess. Exactly. Ew. <laughs> Who wants that shit? Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you want to work? You don't want to work for the government, do you? Um or do you? I guess define work by the work for the government. Okay. I'll give you an example. So during the New Deal in the 1930s, they hired actors, mm -hmm. right? They worked for the government to put on like plays or they were sponsored written by government employees, actors and directors hired by the federal government. Would you want well, to do they, that? Mm, did they hire the playwrights as well? Yeah, 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 everybody, yeah. 
I wouldn't be opposed to it. Really? Yeah. Huh. I mean, if the plays were good. Well, that's the trick, right? That's. <laughs> do you think how likely do you think they would be good? If the, if it, if the government, the federal government, not just states, but the federal government has to put its rubber stamp on it of approval, mm-hmm. how likely is it that you think the art would be good? I don't think it's impossible. I mean, you saw it in the Soviet Union. You saw like Shostakovich and stuff like. Okay. A you know working within the system to make beautiful things. Right. And, well. Okay. But I mean, hmm. sorry, the art in the Soviet Union, though, I mean, was pretty limited. No, definitely. I mean, it's not the ideal model by far, but it's, (laughs) you know, it's not, it's not impossible. And were you, you were born in the Soviet, no, no, you were born post-Soviet, of course, but you were born in Belarus, right? I was born, yeah, in 91. Oh, just at the very, very right, end. At, right at the end. Yeah. Oh, I didn't. Okay, right, right at the very end. I didn't realize that. And how how old were you when you left? Um, three. Okay, I knew that you were essentially an American in terms of where you've lived, right? Yeah, I grew up in Las Vegas. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, um, I want to get to that in a second, but um, for sure, I want to talk about your life. But the um, the other objection I have to democracy is that Americans people it's just way too big of a country with way too many ignorant people in it to be having power over the rest of us and over the rest of the world right america that's why i i i mentioned like an idealized democracy because then ideally people wouldn't be ignorant sure again be able to make informed decisions on behalf of their well-being i know that'd be nice i mean it's just that like Americans don't even know that Syria exists, right? Even much Mm -hmm. less like what the politics of Syria are and whether we should bomb it again. So I just, it terrifies me. And to have 350 million people, most of whom are totally ignorant about politics, um, deciding on the fate of the world, right? Because if you're an American, you get to decide on the fate of everybody in the world. Mm -hmm. You get to determine like who lives and who dies and who lives under which military occupation and you know, which immigrants get to go where and stuff. I mean, we get we are granted so much more power than anyone else as Americans just yeah. because we're citizens of a superpower. But those are my two objections. Um, you can take them for what you will. But so, yeah, you were born in Belarus. Your parents um, are or were acrobats. They were. Yes. OK. They're retired acrobats. <laughs> mm, they're not retired, but they aren't acrobats anymore. They're they're very young. Okay, and, and like my mom's fifty one. Okay, so and, she doesn't perform anymore. And who? And that's I assume that's why you moved to Vegas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they got a gig there. They, my dad was working with Cirque du Soleil. Aha! Uh-huh, I figured um, in the in the nineties, and then we lived in Reno and Atlantic City because they worked in shows. In both of those places. And then we moved back to Las Vegas when I was about seven. Now, my first thought is those are really rough places to grow up in. Am I wrong about that? They're mm, not, I wouldn't say they're rough, maybe psychically, but there's there's a lot of, (laughs) um, yeah, yeah. It wasn't the best. The Southwest in general is kind of um, depressing, but Las Vegas, especially. Yeah. I mean, what is it to live in Vegas when I go there and I see the residential areas in particular? I'm horrified because you can get lost. I mean, isn't it? Don't people get lost often because everything looks the same? It's there's lots of suburban sprawl. Yeah. Yeah. And how did you how does one grow up in Vegas? I mean, I, used, I had students, a couple students who grew up there, but I, and I would always ask them, like, how do you how do you do that? And they would look at me like, what do you mean? It's just like any other place. Did you find that or did you find it especially challenging to be? a child and then an adolescent and Mm. someone who's coming into her own in in Las Vegas. Mm. I mean, I think I had this, the same struggles that most adolescents do just being kind of like angsty and bored and depressed and really on the internet. Um, Mm. And I went to, but um, you know, mostly I was just like going to school and then I went to, I went to a pretty good performing arts high school. That was like a charter school. Um, and so high school was fine, but I graduated early cause I really wanted to leave. So I moved to California when I was 17. And that's when you went to Mills college. Mm-hmm. And I, I live a mile from Mills college right now. 
Oh, cool. Yeah. And I used to teach at a women's college. I used to teach at Barnard. Oh, wow. For do years. you spend much time on the campus? Which mills? Yeah. Do you ever go there? It's been, clo- it's been shut down for a year. I, I drove by it a couple of times. It's nice. It's a beautiful campus. I really loved it at Mills. For sure. Yeah. So your parents were acrobats. They were in Cirque du- Was your mom in Cirque du Soleil too? Um, she was, but later. Okay. Um, she worked in the, the Chris Angel one uh-huh. when, he, when he had a show in Vegas. Um, but she was, my mom was a rhythmic gymnast and my dad was an acrobat. So, so they're they like worked as, as dancers and performers in the other, the other um, entertainment industry. <laughs> I mean, there's no greater physical genius on earth than a Cirque du Soleil acrobat, right? They're very talented. Yes. <laughs> I mean, those are incredible human beings. Mm-hmm. What? Uh, go ahead. A lot of them are from the former Soviet Union or China yeah. Um, because yeah, my parents were sort of like the, like, from the ages of like five or six, like training six days a week to be like Olympic hopefuls. Basically they were in that like Soviet model of churning out <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> athletes. So what was it like? I mean, were they, they must've spent a ton of time on their craft mm-hmm. training and then performing yeah. too. And tra- were they traveling also? Um, my dad was, in the early nineties, but then we sort of really settled in once we settled in America, they weren't in any like touring circuses or anything. And do you have, do you have siblings? No, I'm an only child. An only child. And your parents, um, you've said, you've mentioned, I think I heard this right, that you were, uh, like me, you didn't have the most attentive parents. Is this correct? <laughs> well, they worked a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> my parents were pretty much unaware of my comings and goings my entire childhood was that similar to you or you did you have a freedom in that mm, mm, there wasn't a lot of coming and going because i was in like the deep suburbs no i mean i mean just in my life i mean they didn't know like anything about my life at all yeah they were we there was definitely a chasm and there's a well, you know i speak russian but um there still was sort of like a language barrier because my Russian obviously isn't as good as my English. So I found I couldn't um, express myself eloquently about my comings and goings. Oh, oh to them because mm-hmm. their, their English is limited, right? Yeah. Right. And um, so then the other thing I've been curious about with you is how did you, I mean, you're an intellectual. I know people don't like using that word, but you know, you, you enjoy playing with and thinking about ideas, big ideas. That's all it means. Right. And you have a, you have very serious academic intellectual chops in particular, I think when it comes to like psychology, you're extremely astute. Thank and, I, you. and I assume, and especially the way you combine your psychological analysis with your political analysis, and then also your aesthetic analysis, which mm-hmm. is one of the w- ways in which I think you and your show are unique. I've just never heard that combination political people, as you may have noticed, don't tend to care about aesthetics or psychology. Yeah. Unfortunately, right. cause those are very important parts of, of politics of life mm-hmm. <laughs> and politics. Right. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the main reasons I did the show actually, because I was always a political person, but I always felt there was a hole in the middle of political life, which was that largely like on the left, especially like I remember being around socialists and like, they didn't even know what movies were playing or TV shows were on. They didn't care what clothes they wore. The women never wore makeup. It was just, it was like, in fact, they would sort of look down and all consumerism was bad. So if you spent money on something to make you smell good or look good, that was kind of frowned upon. Right. Mm -hmm. That's one of the big reasons I left the left actually. Um, But I also felt that they were just sort of dumb when it came to uninterested in, in things like aesthetics and psychology and how they might be important in politics, right? And what they're actually concerned with. Right. I love that about right. your show. I love that about your, the way that you think in particular. Thank you. And don't you find that's mm-hmm. true though? I mean, doesn't that set you guys apart from most, even, even like Chapo Trap House, which is like the closest maybe podcast to yours. I mean, they don't, they're not nearly as interested in that stuff as you guys are. No, they're not. As, um, aesthetes <laughs> yeah right um they but on the flip side you know they know a lot more about history and the political process and stuff than we do and it's 
Mm. Um, and part of that is, you know, our femininity probably <laughs> that makes us more interested in stuff like that maybe, but yeah. But yeah, I mean, I studied philosophy at Mills and then I was going to go to graduate school um, to Cal Arts for aesthetics and politics. Oh, wow. Um, but then I couldn't really justify spending the money, even after all of my kind of like the, the scholarships and financial aid and stuff. I was I couldn't justify spending the money on another like useless degree. So, so it's nice to be able to do kind of aesthetics and politics in practice on my podcast. Exactly. I mean, you have, you get to do basically what a professor would do, but without the grading, without the bullshit, without mm -hmm. the academic bullshit. And you get to say whatever you want until you get, until you get canceled anyway. Right. Right. Um, For now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but how did you, do you remember, I mean, were your parents intellectual at all? No. Um, were political? Were they political at all? What were their no. really? My not parents, not really. Uh -huh. They were also kind of like Bernie supporters, um, demo, you know, Democrats before that, like not very engaged in political thought or life. They were they're really young. They're like Gen Xers, you know. Mm -hmm. So they. Thank you for saying that. Uh huh. Because oh, you're, saying, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm your parents' age, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but no, but they are, you know, um, young and they were in their 20s and the 90s and not particularly political then, like most people, I so think. I, so then how do you explain? See, like I got, I'm political and interested in psychology because my parents were political and into psychology. <laughs> Mm -hmm, you know, right. I've, I've done my own things with those, but that's why I'm interested in those general subjects. So how do you, how do you account for you being interested in those things? Mm. Psychologically, I mean, I was never going to be an athlete. My parents didn't want me to be. They, even when I did ballet, they were, the way that it's practice typically in America was very different from the Soviet model. So it felt very kind of like frivolous and pointless to them. Mm. Um, and part of their American dream, you know, was that they would like had broken their bodies to become um, acrobats. And so that they could have, and I was always pretty precocious and like, I learned to read really young. And so they thought that I would um, be like a lawyer or something. They really, they did want me to sort of pursue um academia and do well in school and stuff and partly because I probably was sort of neglected or alone a lot when I was get, getting affirmation from adults in school it felt good and sort of sustained my interest in it so you used the word neglected so I I um as I said my parents didn't pay much attention to me at all I I'm been asking myself this question recently, was I neglected or liberated? I don't um, know. I don't know. Do you feel liberated? I feel both. Mm -hmm. I think they both speak to what happened to me. Um, I think that a lot of the success I've had, a lot of the originality in my work mm -hmm. is probably in part because of that. I was sort of forced to be an independent thinker in a way because mm -hmm. no one was overseeing my mind. They didn't actually try to indoctrinate me, thank God. Um, but so I was kind of left to my own devices and I was always able to sort of stand outside and watch the left, you know, being literally born into it. Yeah. Don't, but do you feel reactionary in any way? Oh yeah. No, there's no doubt. Like on like some they're level. rebelling against your parents. On yeah. Some well that, level. that's what every socialist in Brooklyn says about me. Mm -hmm. And, and they're like 50% right. <laughs> All the guy, the people at Jacobin, the ones who know me, that's what they say. They don't, they're not, they don't like me, but yeah, I mean, sure. There's some of it is some kind of Oedipal uh, rebellion going on against my well, parents. It's that way for everyone, I think. Well, I don't know. See, I've had friends who also- Or not, not necessarily rebelling, but in some way, some reaction to 
to your parents. Yeah, but a lot of people, a lot of friends of mine had left wing parents and they just stayed left wing. They did exactly what their parents wanted them to do. I stayed political, but I I became the sort of, I mean, a major critic of much of their politics, right? Right. Well, that's what I mean. It's like the, maybe those people were validated by their parents for affirming their worldviews. Oh, yeah. And whereas what I got for it was nothing. I got like, not even, <laughs> <laughs> they were like, did you, have you graduated from school yet? Are you done with that? I mean, it was that level. I'm not kidding. I mean, they didn't even know my grades. They didn't know anything. Um, and I would. My parents would, were not that, not that checked out. They wanted, you know, they were invested. Yeah. Okay. So you didn't have that much. You didn't have as much to rebel against, but. Well, they didn't indoctrinate me in any, in any way, really. And in fact, they were telling you not to follow them in their career, right? Yeah. That's a huge gift, right? I think so. Yeah. I think so. And I know, I mean, and I never, I never showed any real, like, I was never particularly coordinated as a child. Or oh, really? <laughs> it was clear that I wasn't going to be like a great dancer. It's so interesting. You didn't inherit the physical talent, but you became a thinker instead. Yeah. How do you, yeah, can you explain that at all? Other than I just luck? I mean, yeah, I don't, I mean, yeah, like I said, like the being validated for, for being precocious and sort of gifted as a child in school probably felt good. And then when I started studying philosophy, yeah, I just really wow. liked it. I really liked, like, because I was a stoner, so I really liked like smoking weed and having like trippy thoughts. And <laughs> <laughs> you're a stoner. I never would. I never would have guessed. Yeah, no. I mean, you you talk about it. Um, so philosophy, I actually was surprised. I would have sworn you were a psychology major. Um, well, they're connected. Certainly. Yeah, I wrote my thesis on Nietzsche. Oh my god, like pre psychological. Oh, you're into okay. That explains why you and I are talking. <laughs> if people who are interested in Nietzsche are all, always going to be friends of mine, or at least we're going to be somehow aligned politically. So tell, yeah. me, tell me about Nietzsche. I've never heard you talk about him. Um. Well, I read him when I was like nineteen in like a an intro to existentialism class, and he really like freaked me out. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, and when I read his special, I think his writings on like the eternal return and everything and his like critiques of morality. I mean, his writing was just so exciting and it felt like such a um, audacious and exhilarating way to, to think. Mm. Um, and it really like blew my mind. And then I, um, I wrote my thesis on, um, I was reading Walter Kaufman, who's like the main Nietzsche translator. I have his he books. Had, he had a footnote in one of his books um, where Nietzsche said something about women and Kaufman sort of qualified it in a footnote and said that Nietzsche's statements on women were sort of time bound and shallow. And I thought that that really did him a kind of disservice and mm -hmm. that actually he had really interesting um, psychological insights into femininity um, that were in line with his like liberatory thinking in a lot of ways. I, I know, um, no, I know nothing about this. Please tell me. And that they actually, they weren't sexist and they didn't really like, they weren't contradictions in his line of thought because they, he basically wanted to sort of protect women from the enlightenment so that they would retain their natural kind of like, um, cause he was all about like nature and civilism to make man civilized is to make him weak, you yeah. know? Right. So I think he saw in women's sort of like, I mean, he calls it naivets or a kind of like animalism, um, but that there was actual real tremendous strength in that. And in Eke Homo, he says that in the in the natural world, like woman has first rank and that feminism mm -hmm. sort of was this mistake that spawned these like abortive women, he calls them, who like thought that buying into the enlightenment 
would liberate them, but actually it would hinder them profoundly. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so I'm seeing so much here right now. Um, the enlightenment becomes feminism for a lot of women, right? That feminism is an enlightenment project, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. you're a big critic of feminism. Um, but Nietzsche sounds like, this is another thing where I actually disagree with both you and Anna. Um, it sounds like Nietzsche is with you on essentialism. It sounds like he's essentialist with women a bit. Like a lot, mm -hmm. what he sees as feminine characteristics are natural. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Or eternal? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a total postmodernist on this stuff. I'm, I'm Mr. Anti-essentialist, but I'm open to all arguments. I mean, so it sounds like you, you're with him on that though. I mean, you are, I've heard you guys talk about this. You're both at least sympathetic to the idea of some essential traits for the genders. Yeah, or that they're not even, I don't even think about them as being necessarily like biologically essential. Okay. But I do think there are, for example, like masculine and feminine forces. And that um, like Jung's sort of ideas about the anima and the animus and stuff. And I think that that's, that duality is, is, is real. And you see them as trans-historical, meaning I mean, they stay sort of re relatively unchanged over time? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, that's the Jung archetypes kind of depend on that, don't they? Yeah. yeah. And even like, you know, like Aristotelian writings about, um, well, women being basically like deformed men. <laughs> right which w wouldn't be how I would articulate it, but yeah, the sort of like Apollonian and the Dionysian and the relegating um, masculinity to kind of like reason and order mm. and perfection and women or femininity being more the realm of the, of the earth and the, and the body the cosmic. Yeah. Right. And the body too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's why, yeah. So historians, so I'm a trained historian and we are trained to hate that kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. Anything that's trans-historical, it's like a bad word. It's like an epithet to say something that's trans-historical. You know, come on, can't be true because these things are social constructs. They're created, they're created or recreated by human beings, these ideas of the woman, of femininity. Mm -hmm. Um, but since you're saying it's not biologically rooted, I mean, it's certainly possible that there were archetypes created at a certain point in history that have been renewed time and again through history, right? Mm -hmm. That's perfectly plausible to me. It sounds like, is that what you're saying? Yeah, but with, there is a, you know, the biological element of pregnancy. True. <laughs> there and is that. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason that that's connected to femininity archetypally. What about the women who have no maternal instinct? Well, those, you know, Nietzsche would call them sort of aborted. Oh. Abortive or kind of misguided women. Oh, oh really? Because they're, they're transgressing their, their natural uh, obligation. Or they're not something. Like, yeah. So wait, yeah. Do, you, do you have a maternal instinct now that you're almost thirty? Sure. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, yeah. yeah so I want to have. I want to have a baby. So you're a good Nietzschean woman then. Yeah. Hope to bear the Ubermensch and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> but he won't be a Nazi, right? This we we don't think that Nietzsche was a <laughs> Nazi. Okay. He won't be yeah. Hitler. He won't be the next. So Nietzsche. So you were a Nietzsche person, and I didn't know this about. Women and Nietzsche, I got to look into this. We we teach courses on Nietzsche at Renegade University, and I haven't even thought about that. And I ta I've taught him myself for decades. That's really interesting. But um, so you, can you talk a little bit more about feminism? And you have a lot of beefs, a lot of beefs. Can you summarize? Yeah, well, feminism is another term that I think needs defining and that people have a difficult time with and it's most sort of mm, I guess the idea that 
men and women ought to be equal is sort of the the basic definition of feminism right and i would disagree with that premise um but i i mean i wouldn't say i'm like a female supremacist even but <laughs> I, guess well, I, I am women are definitely superior yeah i think <laughs> You don't want to be a man, trust me. You do not. Want I really, I definitely don't. Yeah. No. Being a man is no good. No. <laughs> mm -mm. Well, why do you think that? Why do you think it's no good to be a man? Mm. Well, I don't have access to, to that experience. I'm no, I know. Sure, no, sure I know. But what do you I'm assume? It sure has its perks. Kind of. Well, what do you, I mean, sure, but what do you, what do you assume? What do you guess? And I, then I can confirm. Um, I, I don't know why, we, why do you think it sucks to be a man? <laughs> um, well, the first thing that comes to mind, you know, we've talked about loneliness and neglect, right? Mm -hmm. Our common experiences as, ch as children, men do that to themselves. They make themselves isolated and alienated. They're mm -hmm. very, very bad at emotional connection, at maintaining friendships, at maintaining meaningful relationships, at communicating about things other than sports and about expressing ang emotions other than anger. And men generally speaking are very bad at those things, which leaves them. You mean them. straight, straight men. Thank They're you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Very important. Yes. This is why I've always loved gay men and gay male culture mm -hmm. since I was a kid, even though I was a straight guy, um, because they were the ones um, that didn't have those problems. And they were the ones who could talk about their feelings Mm -hmm. And they were the ones who didn't have to talk about the Steelers game to have some connection with another human being. Right. And so I find, I, I just, I know that there's just a tremendous amount of loneliness among men. I think that is the number one problem. Um, and women, certainly there are many lonely women too, but women in general, it seems to me, are much better at sustaining, nurturing relationships. Yeah, I would say that's definitely true of a, a contemporary experience. But I think on a more fundamental level, the mm, archetypally, I think maybe men do feel cut off from a kind of natural order hmm. because they aren't able to, they don't have the same reproductive faculties that women do. And that's what sort of, motivated them trans historically <laughs> to you know devise civilization to undertake their own their own kind of productive efforts oh wow because they were cut off from this very fundamental experience because we can't create children we're going to create civilization yeah because you can't bring forth life, you have to generate something else. It's like kind of a... Who, who has said this besides Dasha Nekrasova? I'm sure people have. I think um, uh, Camille Paglia has in, 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 her, in her own ways. I have not heard this. That's fascinating. It's like Freud's sublimation in a way, sort of like the energy to create gets channeled into building civilization because we can't build a baby. Yeah, and probably somewhere in there also like protecting women and children. Mm -hmm. So you sort of envelop them in this. <laughs> yeah. Ideally so, protective structure. Yeah. And so our primary mode of relating is actually the public, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to the individual and the intimate. Yeah. The, the child, the child mother bond, right? Is the ultimate intimate one-on-one -on -one relationship. We can't do that. We can't have that relationship. Not really, not the way that women, yeah. not the way the mothers do. And so we tend to think, and this is true, we tend to think more abstractly outside the immediate and on a larger scale. And we tend to speak also for other people, right? Mm -hmm. Who we don't yeah. even know, like strangers, you know, like people in other countries. Right. Right. Um, that's a, I like it. Even though it's trans historical, <laughs> I still like it. <laughs> Yeah, there's obviously a lot of other stuff going on.
No, but it, the thing about trans historical, by the way, let me just say, I mean, I believe in such things as like culture. I believe that certain ideas have, you know, retained life, you know, over, over long periods of time. It's, things can be essentially trans historical, meaning that they just last a long time. Right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, um, I, I, I like that. So, but do you think that women who don't have children or don't want to have children are there are necessarily going to lead what a less fulfilled life, less happy life? No, not necessarily. You said they were, what was it? What would Nietzsche say about them? They're aborted. What? Ab abortive. Abortive. Yeah. Sorry. Um, he said the beware the abortive women, the one who lack the stuff for children. Like basically he says that opting into feminism will deprive you from what he calls the labyrinth of audacious insights. I don't, I'm not co-signing any of that. I think that there's, you know, a lot of women who I respect and admire who choose not to have children and pursue other things. And that's all valid. And I can't speak to their sort of spiritual psychological fulfillment, but certainly there's a lot of, you know, reasons to have kids and to not have kids also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, so how did you, yeah. How did you come to this place? How did you come to this kind of thinking, which is so counter to you live in New York. You used to live in Oakland. Mm -hmm. You went to Mills college for God's sake. These are like citadels of feminism and liberalism and left wingism. How did you, how did you come to have these heterodox ideas, especially about mm -hmm. feminism, but any of it? I guess, yeah, I don't know, through reading, through my, through my studies. <laughs> really? Um, yeah, and Mills, at least at the time, I don't, I don't know how it is now, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like... Um, in the business really of like radicalizing women, I don't think maybe in some other departments, but the philosophy department was extremely small mm -hmm. and basically had like a Nietzsche of Hegel Marx Nietzsche Avenue and then like a Wittgenstein Avenue. And that was basically it. And the classes were extremely small. So I was able to do just have lots of like attention from my teachers and to pursue like independent learning in my own way and study what I wanted to study. But wait a second, did you start to call into question feminism at a women's college? Um, probably after, <laughs> yeah, I but say. I definitely felt misogynistic impulses when I was, when I was in college. Misogynistic impulses. Yeah. Like I hate, like I hated the sound of women's voices and they were, <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> hey, wait, and you were at a women's college. Yeah, well, that's why, because it was all... Oh, I see. You got some... Yeah, I was maybe overloaded. Yeah, and, and the campus is kind of like, it's in Oakland, but it's kind of off on its own. There's nothing really around it. Yeah, it's <laughs> fair. I didn't live on campus, but it was, yeah. Oh, okay. It was remote. So you, so why did you choose to go to a women's college then? Or, or maybe mm. you, just, you didn't know you were a misogynist yet. Yeah, is that it? <laughs> well, I couldn't afford to go to Berkeley because it was the recession and they made it very difficult to get in-state tuition. Mm -hmm. And then Mills offered me a scholarship because I went to community college for a year um, because I wanted to get California residency and then to go to a UC. Um, but this was 2009. And so Berkeley made it much harder to get in-state tuition. Which community college did you go to? Berkeley City College. Oh, really? Yeah, I that was, was really where I um, <laughs> started to, to turn on leftism. <laughs> oh, I was going to tell you. So, you know, I was born and raised in Berkeley. Okay, that makes sense. Born and raised. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you're, so your parents are like Berkeleyites. Yes, totally. Yeah. And, and I was going to tell you, man, this was probably about six months ago. You guys did a... I think Berkeley was even in the title of the episode. Berkeley Brain, yeah. You did like this little like three minute kind of rant slash speech about Berkeley that was <laughs> so completely correct. It was 
<laughs> it was stunning. I almost transcribed it and, tweet and tweeted it out. Wow. But you sort of ended it with, I mean, you just described it as exactly how I see it, but as a bunch of older hippies, this is me, but I think I'm mostly, I think we're older hippies. And I love how you said that at the very end, yelling at, yelling about nothing to each other. <laughs> <laughs> because the righteousness will please talk to me about your experience in Berkeley. Yeah. I don't remember what I said, but that sounds, that sounds right. <laughs> yeah. How did you experience my hometown? Which I, I no longer, I can't even go there anymore. It makes me so crazy. Um, well, I guess initially, I think probably I have felt like an aesthetic sort of revulsion. Oh, to, what? That's the only that. good part of it. I like the aesthetics of Berkeley. <laughs> well, maybe as a place, but I mean, hippie kind of aesthetic. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, um, right. How people are um, dressed. Yeah. And just the, like kind of granola, crunchy culture, mm -hmm. which was like um, charming, but not really my thing. And then I worked and I actually worked at a video store in Albany, oh, yeah? which is north of North, you know, yeah. North, North Berkeley. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked for a professor, actually a law professor at, at Berkeley for also like a year and a half as like an assistant. And so I just felt very privy to sort of the inconsistencies and hypocrisies of liberals in Berkeley who would like go to Chez Panisse um, <laughs> uh -huh. yep. while renouncing or espousing some kind of like egalitarian lefty politics. Yeah. Um, the first thing you'll notice about Berkeley communists like my parents is that all of their favorite things are businesses, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Rest restaurants and boutiques and cafes and all that. Right. Totally. So when you were, wait, how did you, what were the contradictions you saw? What was this guy, this professor revealing to you? Um, well, just a kind of, and she wasn't a, a communist or she actually told me, cause I was identifying as like a Marxist at the time. She told me when I was graduating college, not to tell anybody that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she, yeah, she was like outwardly because she had made her, career concerned with issues of um you know social justice while living this very sort of alienated bourgeois lifestyle right. so it made it called into question sort of any of the validity of, <laughs> of her critiques yeah and the the passion they have for politics is off the charts mm -hmm. and I mean, they are so earnest about it and it's really, I mean, I grew up in it and I was one of them. I mean, it was really, we were fighting the devil. Mm -hmm. It was galactic, man, how important our political struggles were in the Bay area, convincing absolutely no one. Well, yeah, they're so not affected by any, any of it. Right. I, so I never knew, I literally did not know a Republican until I was in my twenties. I didn't know a Christian until I was in my twenties. Wow. I didn't know, I didn't know a conservative until I was in my twenties. I didn't know a veteran of the military until I was in my twenties. That's how much of a bubble that place is. And yet we would march in the streets all the time about stuff in Berkeley and San Francisco, yeah. conv convincing no one because we, everyone agreed. The, uni the uniformity is ridiculous, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, I took, had to take like an English credit at Berkeley City College. And I had a professor who, our, one of our assigned readings was Days of War, Nights of Love, that like crime think kind of crust punk zine. I don't know if you're familiar um, with it. Mm. It's very like proto Occupy kind of like okay. um, squatters rights, like okay. eat, eat, out of, eat out of the trash. Like it was like the ABCs of like being a crust punk basically mm -hmm. and even at the time I was like 18 and I was like this seems really kind of irresponsible <laughs> like I'm an impressionable person why would you make me read a book about how it's virtuous to eat out of the trash and like how <laughs> how you don't have to actually have to brush your teeth <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> now that you say crust punk, I know who you're talking about. I actually, my buddies in college were like the proto crust punks. They were like the original ones in the eighties and nineties. Yeah. So I know that, I know that vibe, the, the dumpster diving. Yeah. I know that whole, anar the anarchist dumpster diving crowd. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, the telegraph. <laughs> telegraph Avenue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of like sort of fo hobos, phobos, you know, exactly. Riding trains. And... Yep. I had friends who rode trains who were like middle-class people from Long Island. You know? Exactly. <laughs> I wonder if people are still doing that. I kind of hope so. Why? <laughs> Because at least like someone's doing something, you know, <laughs> something interesting. It feels like quaint to think about it now. Yeah. The yeah. And so wait, and then you moved to did you move to L.A.? Yeah, you did. Right. After Berkeley. Yeah. yeah. And what was that like? I lived in L.A. for many years, too. For you. Um, it was very bleak for a lot of it, especially because, well, after I decided not to go to grad school, I decided to try to pursue acting. Right. <laughs> um which was extremely depressing and demoralizing in various ways. And I never, I don't know how to drive. So still, still mm. maybe 30, was, maybe 30 is a charm. <laughs> um, though I live in New York now, I don't have to. So yeah, my lifestyle was just very bizarre. Yeah. How and, did you, how did you live in LA without a car? Um, I took the bus and I took the, the trains are actually not, not bad in LA. True. If you live, um, if you're near, if you're near a train. Well, eventually I moved to Koreatown. Oh, I love Koreatown. That's, that's a very easy place to, yeah. to live as a pedestrian. I love K-Town. Me too. Really. My son and I love going there. The food's great. It's just, it's just fun. It's like, you really feel like you're in Seoul. It's so Korean. Totally. I loved it. Yeah. You don't see, really had it all. Like you don't see English on on the walls on signs or anything like that it's yeah like it's great. cool very cool yeah so eventually yeah once i kind of got my k-town time and i had a good i i enjoyed it so yeah you, you decided to be an actress right out of college or right well after you gave up on grad school yeah like pretty oh. late for for that but like 23 24 yeah and and uh you weren't, were you doing that in college at all? Were you doing acting? Mm -mm, had you no. acted, had you acted before in, in high school maybe? Yeah, I was in like some plays in junior high and stuff. Um, but no, not really. I wasn't, yeah, working oh. as an act and as an actress at all. Um, and when I moved to LA, I was cast in like a student film um, that Amanda Milius was making. I don't know who that you is. Know, John Milius is. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Yes. His daughter. And now she's actually a big MAGA person, which isn't surprising. Oh, no way. But very interesting father-daughter dynamic stuff there where she made this basically, I think with money from the NRA, actually, she made this like, <laughs> it was her thesis film and it was like a post-apocalyptic lesbian Western about a dystopia where the government had taken everyone's guns away. Oh, no and way. And then I played the sort of like damsel in distress girlfriend of the main character who gets abducted um and then she has to like find kind of the last existing shotgun to like <laughs> 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 it's a yeah it's a really weird movie so but so i did you um, say lesbian too there was lesbians in this it's me and the other character this like lesbian couple who's gotcha. living off the off the land in a dystopian future <laughs> so this explains your dalliance with the right wing <laughs> that, that, that's I, I didn't even really know like, <laughs> what about the Milius family at that point I was just like you know happy to have the work I didn't realize you weren't an actor until after college mm -hmm. and why on earth did you choose that profession mm, it's this is a pretentious it's it's pretentious to say but it felt like um, if I wasn't going to go to, to graduate school for philosophy or psychology or something, it felt a way of like using psychology and philosophy kind of in praxis because mm -hmm. it's a very, um, psychological craft. And I was interested in learning about how to, how to do it. Yeah. Um, that's not pretentious at all. 
I was just, first, I was going to ask out of the blue, like you've been in therapy a lot, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So have I, my, my mother is a shrink. So I did 10 years of psycho psychoanalytic therapy. And then I wow. did like mm, about a year and a half of like CBT kind of therapy. And your dad's like a Trotskyist or something. They're all like X everything, but yeah, okay. my dad is my biological father's dead. My stepfather was nothing. They, they quit, po they quit radical politics when I was like a teenager. Okay. But, um, I, always know i don't know if you have this experience i can tell whether someone's been in therapy within like two or three minutes of talking to them you know i mean there's, Why? Just, there's like um there's a facility with uh their own feelings and there's a, also just a self-knowledge that people who haven't mm -hmm. been in therapy they, they just have that there's a way they're comfortable talking about themselves they're comfortable talking about painful moments in their lives People who haven't mm -hmm. been in therapy just won't do that or it's just too painful for them. But yeah. I would imagine, when did you first, I started when I was in my 20s. Actually, I started when I was a kid and then again when I was 19 and then Jesus, all like all through my 30s and 40s. When did you Are start? you in therapy currently? No, I need to be. <laughs> um, I, I did a stint of therapy after college because I thought that graduating would be kind of challenging for me which it was so I sort of preemptively started seeing a therapist um sort of through some like institute in San Francisco some like intern I was gonna but say it was very helpful I was gonna say you could have had my mother as a therapist that would have been <laughs> <laughs> she was yeah she was like 27 or something she was yeah no. she was nice um <laughs> and then for like two or so years in my mid-20s and now I'm in therapy again what do you for like, like half a year? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to ask you about this. So I found psychoanalytic psychotherapy to be 80% a waste of time and money. I think mm -hmm. I, got, I got a lot of valuable insights. I'd learned a lot about who I am and about my childhood and I value that, but then I just stayed and stayed and stayed and I didn't get any, I never felt better. It never made me happier, not at all. But dialectical behavior therapy, which is like a variant of CBT really did. I actually feel better and I'm happier because of it. I've been hearing about DBT recently oh, yeah? um, because I know a lot of people with borderline personality disorder who do the, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, by the way, I'm a little bit offended by you guys constantly making fun of us. Sorry. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <laughs> the borderlines out here, we're offended. No, it's no, it's totally, you're dead right about us. No, I think, well, uh, I mean, I think a lot of people have borderline tendencies. Oh, I check every box except for the cutting, which is the first. Okay. You look at the list of symptoms. The first one is cutting, self-harm. I don't do that, but I do every single other thing under the borderline heading. Yeah. Well, that's, that tracks <laughs> sort of with your, what you've told me about your family and stuff so far. How so? Wait, to explain well, being, that. Ne being neglected. Yeah. Is that, does that go with borderline? I don't know. Is that 10 and 10? My understanding is, well, a borderline, and I'm obviously not a doctor, but that it's often, it, well, it's very feminized, right? Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of the time when people are talking about BPD, what they're really talking about is a kind of like PTSD. Mm -hmm. And that um, um, abandonment and neglect in early childhood is a kind of, trauma you know and um it has really like deep impacts on people's psyches and their lives and so you know i think a lot of people even if they're not diagnosed experience have some kind of borderline experience because no one wants to be you know abandoned right um but some people's sort of propensity for self-destruction or their death drive or whatever you want to call it seems, seems more attuned or something. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. So what kind of therapy do you do? I, um, I, I talk to a Jungian analyst. Do you really? And I do dream work and stuff. Well, um, that also tracks. <laughs> and I would agree with you that, you know, I was very, very interested in Freud and I was very interested in psychoanalysis and still am. 
right. but in terms of um, therapeutic value, I think I haven't done CBT or DBT, but um, Jungian analysis, at least, and like more kind of behavioral modes of therapy are obviously much more effective. I have no idea what Jungian therapy would look like. What do you talk about? Um, we talk about my dreams a lot, but we also, the person that I work with is, uses something called the Enneagram. Do you oh, know I've, what that I've is? Heard, I've heard you talk about it on the pod, I think. Yeah, it's like a personality test that's very maligned, actually, because it's been um, co-opted by like kind of weird evangelical Christians and there's a weird like corporate contingent of it but it's just we just I use it just as sort of like a framework and like a language for discussing various archetypal psychic forces is this the one with the letters like everyone's a particular that's like Myers-Briggs Myers-Briggs no okay this is different it's different okay it's numbers so oh really so Okay, so do you identify a particular archetypal traits in yourself? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I'm an Enneagram type four. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Um, you are pro you seem like you might be a four as well. Fours are um, sort of they're called like the the romantic or the um, I forget what the other archetypal word for it is, but they're they're big sort of wound. It's nine sort of archetypal, archetypal personality types and each one corresponds to a kind of core wound um, mm. that shapes your ego, basically. Huh. And, and ab abandonment is the one for is the one for fours. Oh, I see. So that's why you and I are both fours. Maybe. I'm I'm not. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. And then so what would be the Jungian, what's the therapeutic practice? What's therapeutic? about it well Jung believes in a kind of integration mm. um like when you talk about people in politics not being very interested in psychology it's because they're very uncomfortable with their like shadow mm. or I guess in for what Freud would call like the id but it's very different it's like it's a um and so your ego becomes this incredibly rigid prism through which you view the world that kind of warps and perverts <laughs> reality to bolster your sense of selfhood hmm. because if you actually called into question any of the, the things that you believe you would be like shattered for hmm. you know not you but you know one mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so Jungian work is sort of about unpacking one psyche and attempting to to be a more integrated person who is at least like mindful of their ego's machinations. Okay, so it's like radical honesty. Uh, I guess not even. Yeah, or, I mean, it, yeah. But it's about it's about looking it's at definitely about being honest. Yeah. Okay, and it's about and it's about looking at oneself clearly, without mm -hmm. without pretension and without. And, and trying to look at, stand outside this veil that ego puts in front of us. Yeah. Like, through, through which yeah. we see the world, right? That's the prism yeah. through which we see the world and it's, you're, you're, at, you're being asked to stand outside of it and look at all of it. Exactly. It's almost like a drug trip. Yeah, totally. Right? <laughs> well, that's I mean, why drugs involve a kind of ego death. Yeah, but you also- yeah, stand I've never done like ayahuasca or anything, but that's what I hear. Right. And you, but you're sort of standing out, you find yourself suddenly standing outside of yourself and looking at yourself. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you find, I mean, again, like, as I said, I did 10 years. And I was like, F I don't feel any better guys. Like, and I've, sp and I've spent tens of thousands of dollars. What's going on here. Do you find this actually makes you feel better? Mm, yeah. Not that maybe not the therapy itself, though. Sometimes it does, but the sort of the habits of mind. Mm hmm and the attempting to sort of trend towards stability. It's a process, it's imminent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no like cure, you know. Mm -hmm. 
and you have no borderline traits you're saying or not many no i do when i was younger i was definitely like super borderline ask <laughs> oh how so just you know if i felt um abandoned mostly in like romantic partnerships i would like fly off the rails and <laughs> have like a very yeah a borderline activity like a kind of textbook borderline kind of habit i think that i used to do is like if someone's if my boyfriend was like leaving for work or something i would like pick a fight so that he would stay okay not like consciously but you right. know I like would suddenly become upset or find ways to kind of like stoke conflict and drama because that felt like a kind of closeness to me that was preferable to being alone. And do you still have abandonment issues in relationships like that? Mm, yeah, but I'm way less triggered. Like, you know, I'm more have mindfulness around my, my, my triggers and stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I can feel like I'm floating in outer space really quickly, like that, that alone for, and it's completely irrational. I mean, I can, I have a son, I have a girlfriend, I have friends, I have a network, I have a podcast, I have 20, 28,000 Twitter followers, whatever, you know, like I'm surrounded by people. I have a huge, huge life with all sorts of people all around me, but just like that, I can feel like I am completely alone in the universe and I'm tethered. Like all yes always gonna and it's always gonna be that way just in an instant I can feel that way but it passes yeah eventually after a very long night <laughs> that's yeah that's the thing with getting older too is sort of like the ups and the highs and lows balance out a little bit or at least there's a, a mindfulness for me that the, the lows will pass Oh yeah. Right. Yes. Experience is huge for me. Like, and now I know that's how I deal with anxiety now is I say, okay, Thad, 20 plus years ago, whatever you, you felt just this way about something that is now insignificant. You've, and you've mm -hmm. done that countless times. So you can probably survive this night. That does help. That does help. For but sure. What, but what do you know? You're not even 30 yet. I know. Think of all the wisdom I'll gain. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be a new woman in my thirties. You're going to be a new woman. Dasha, thank you for doing this. Really Thanks for having it. me. This was great. And thank you for just making a fantastic, what is it? Piece of art? I don't it's know. A, journalism? It's a, it's a podcast. It's definitely it's a podcast. Not journalism. <laughs> oh, it's journalism. It's all of it. I think it's both. I think it's art and journalism. Everyone should listen to Red Scare. And everyone should um, think of it the way I do. <laughs> so thank, thank you, you, Dasha. Thanks for having me. Okay, take care. Good luck with the movie too. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To join the new Renegade University, go to renegadeuniversity.com. To join the new Unregistered Underground, the supporting listeners group for the podcast, go to unregisteredunderground.com. Thanks for listening.